everyone. Welcome to the show, The Path of Me. I'm your host, Wendy Hutchinson. And today we have a beautiful guest. Her name is uh, Dr. Cindy Childress. And the name of her company is Childress Communications. Welcome, Cindy. How are you today? Thank you, Wendy. I'm great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, I know you're a, an entrepreneur. You have a staff, a writing staff, a writing business. But I'd love to go back to the beginning because we all change and evolve throughout our lives. So I'm sure you are a much different person today than you were as a child growing up in Tennessee. Maybe you can tell me a little bit about your childhood. Sure. Well, I grew up in a very small rural town and there wasn't much to do there except read books. Um, we had a creek behind our house, and you could go out there, but it was the same creek every day. So <laughs> um, reading was my way to discover the world. And um, I have wanted to be a writer since I was in the third grade, and I realized that the way that those books got written was somebody wrote them. <laughs> right. Right. And I was like, well, <laughs> that sounds amazing. I want to take other people on the kind of journeys that I get to go on as a reader. And so that really started my love of books and love of reading um, and really thinking about writing and sharing words as communication, and which is one of the words in my company. <laughs> um, but, you know, I was overweight um, as a child. Uh, by the time I was 17, I weighed over 200 pounds. Oh, that's so and tough. That must have been very hard for you. Um, anybody going through high school overweight. I mean, we're all so self-conscious anyway. Yes, and that was before we had Megan Trainer on stage making it cool. Yeah, right. <laughs> and yeah, and it was really tough. And so I was carrying around, it was like a whole, I was carrying around a whole extra person. Wow. And, you know, I've described it as um, waiting for birth. Like I felt like I was waiting to be born. Like there was something that I was going to be that I wasn't yet. And <laughs> I kind of knew that and I didn't know how to birth myself. <laughs> as right. How to get there, right? Or who she was. You knew that you had a spark. There was a divine spark inside of you, but it wasn't, it wasn't apparent who you were going to be yet. Yes. And then I did the academic track. Um, you know, you did mention that I'm Dr. Cindy and I am. And, um, but my travel through academia was partly just because my family thought that was safe. Like the idea of me being a professional writer, they just couldn't even imagine it. They couldn't wrap their mind around it. So yeah. that, those, that PhD after your name meant something to them. Yeah. They thought, you know, that was the stamp of approval that they thought I needed. So I got it. And, you know, but, but I excelled in school and I always did really well. I was always in the top of my class. And so I felt like that I was in the right place and doing the right things. Um, and where my life changed in a big way is um, I fell in love with an oil and gas man. <laughs> and this is while I was completing my dissertation, um, which is I have an English generalist degree with a creative dissertation in poetry. And, um, <laughs> and he had the opportunity to work in Malaysia and I'd only been dating Jack for like three months. Really? Yeah. I mean, we were only just boyfriend and girlfriend only seeing each other. And he just said, um, so how would you feel about living overseas? And I'm like, Oh no. <laughs> wow. And he told me he had the opportunity. I thought about it. Um, and I really made the choice that has defined, if I were going to say what are the choices that have defined my life, like deciding to stay in academia for the MA, the MA and the PhD were definitely defining moments. Um, and then the other thing is falling in love with Jack. And then I had to make the choice. Do I stay on this academic path and become a professor? You know, I'd published papers and presented at conferences. I did everything you need to do to be horrible, right? Right. And then I'm like, and my, my teaching evaluations were always the highest marks. The students loved learning from me. So I'm like, that's a sign I should be doing that. Right. But then with Jack, I mean, he was so amazing that I was like, if I miss my only chance for love, 
Right. I'm going to look back and I'm not going to care that I have tenure or whatever. I'm going to be thinking about <laughs> that beautiful man that I just let walk away because I didn't have the guts to move to Malaysia. <laughs> wow. That was a huge step out of your comfort zone. I mean, to leave the country, you barely know this guy. I mean, how, how did you make that or come to that decision? You just let your heart decide for you or? I did let my heart decide. Um, I've, you know, I'm a writer, so I made lists. <laughs> <laughs> Pros and cons. Yes, I did brainstorming. <laughs> <laughs> and just in the lives that I, in the, in the past that I imagined for myself, and the one that I saw really clearly, which was I become a professor. I knew what that looked like. I had professors who, you know, had made sacrifices for love or hadn't, and I saw how that had played out for them. Mm -hmm. And um, one story that stayed with me is one of my professors told me about one of her professors who um, she and her husband worked in different states because that was where they had their positions as professors. And they only saw each other like in the summer and they would go back and forth. And then he died tragically in an accident. Oh, wow. And that professor said, you know, and I just think about my mentor and I think, you know, would she have made that choice if she knew? Right. All that lost time, yeah. right, for a job. Yeah. yeah, and so, and the professor I'm talking about, Young Sing Wu, so she had made the choice to teach at the same university as her husband, even though really with her pedigree, she could have taught at a higher tier university. Sure. But she, chose, she made that choice for love. And, um, and I just thought, you know, I have regret about my professional direction. Like I can get over that. I can do something about that. But if I have regret about love, like there may not be anything I can do. <laughs> Who knows if it's your one shot? I mean, we don't we don't have a, a crystal ball. Right? <laughs> I'm so glad you took the leap. And so within a few months, it sounds like you packed up. You completed your PhD. You must were you working at the time? Had you completed your program, or how did the timing of that work? So sure. So I had already completed my coursework, and I was just doing. Uh, I was ABD, which is all but dissertation, and. Um, I made the choice to finish before I went overseas because even though you can be ABD for like seven years to your dissertation, I didn't want to drag it out and then never finish. I know people who have been in that situation and, you know, I put in all the time and effort. I definitely wanted to finish and I could get the sure. degree. Sure. It was important for me before I left. And yeah, and I really just trusted my instincts and went for it. Um, <laughs> So there I was in Malaysia, which I never... Yeah, what was it like for you, this small town Tennessee girl moving all the way across? The, um, you must have learned so much about yourself from that experience. What was that like for you? Oh, yeah. Well, I had major culture shock. <laughs> I bet you did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So everything is different there. And I moved there from Louisiana. So what was consistent was the humidity. So <laughs> you got the weather down. Yeah, it had been July in um in Louisiana when I got to Malaysia up off the plane, it was just as hot and humid, but it never changes because they truly don't have seasons. I mean there is a rainy season when it rains more, but it always rains a lot. Right. And it's always hot and humid every day, like between eighty five and eighty six where you can be. And, um, yeah, and then, you know, the people there, you know, because it is a former British colony, you know, there's enough English spoken um, that you don't need to learn the local languages. Mm -hmm. I did learn a little bit just because, you know, as a language person, I find it interesting. And then <laughs> just for communication, it always helps to just greet somebody in their tongue, even if you're going to conduct your business in English. It's just friendly. Um, and getting to know the people and the way things work there, which is just very different from America in very many ways, um, was it was a good opportunity. I'm really glad I did it also because in Malaysia and especially Indonesia, which we also live there, you know, there's not a lot of people that look like me. Right. So, <laughs> so um, I got the rare opportunity for a blonde American to be thrust into a culture where you stand out. 
where yeah. you might be in a movie theater and you're the only person who looks like you representing your people. <laughs> yeah, I, what was the response to you? Would people stop you in the street or were they just staring at you a lot? What was that like? In Kuala Lumpur, which is a, you know, a big metropolitan city, um, they had seen blonde Caucasian girls before, but I would still get looks, especially you would be able to tell at different times of year for festival when the rural people would come into the city right. for festivals. And then I would get the looks. Um, and then when I was in Indonesia, I really was a rarity. We were in Balikpapan, which is on the Borneo Island, not Bali, but Balikpapan. Mm -hmm. and, um, people would just come up to me and touch my hair. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I really understand <laughs> how that doesn't feel good when it happens to other people because it did happen to me but at the same time i understood they they didn't hate me they were just curious yes. and it was like i was a purple elephant yeah. <laughs> they believe the elephant was there in the first place never mind that it was purple right. and, and that must have been really eye-opening for you i think when we travel or experience other cultures we create an experience and then typically we become more understanding of the things that connect us mm -hmm. through the awareness of things that separate us makes sense. yes yeah i remember one morning when i took a jog through our little neighborhood where we lived in bali Papan, and I go by this house that wasn't fully built yet, and so it didn't have any windows in it. And I didn't think anybody lived there, but I was kind of looking at it because I was like, it looks like there's stuff in there. I was trying to figure it out. And then the people inside the house start yelling, Boule, Boule, and that means foreigner, so they meant me. So I'm like, what's going on? And like the whole family runs to those windows where there's no glass pane and they're just they've never seen a foreigner <laughs> it's like well in their neighborhood on foot yeah <laughs> and <laughs> you know they stop eating their breakfast to come look at me so then <laughs> <laughs> oh my god which is morning so salamat pagi is the formal greeting for good morning but you wouldn't yell good morning you would yell morning so right. i said pagi and they were like pagi <laughs> <laughs> That's so cute. Kept running, and I was like, huh, I probably made their day. <laughs> you did? They're probably still talking about it. Could be. I am, too. It was, it was a big deal, <laughs> <Yeah>, right? <laughs> True. Yes. So how long were you there? We were in, we were overseas, all said, um, seven years. So we spent four and a half years in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur, and then two years in Balikpapan, Indonesia. Wow. So were you working? all through that time what were you doing well he i know he had a job in the gas and oil industry so how did you fill your days and time yes well at first i was still writing doing my creative writing and i was sending it out for publication and you know from 2001 to 2008 i was consistently publishing six to twelve pieces of creative writing a year in you know that's, cool. that's amazing it really is and I felt you know yeah I thought like you know it's definitely on my path and I honestly can't tell you exactly what happened because I know I mean I've looked and I've been honest with myself right you know enough time has passed I go back to the poems and I'm like are these really as good as the other ones had been or was I slipping or you know and I look and I'm like I mean no but for some reason I went through two years and I didn't get a single poem accepted for publication and because I felt like that was my path I felt betrayed um, <laughs> And so I like to say poetry is the boyfriend that broke my heart. <laughs> and, and so um, I just, I came to a decision and I said, you know, I don't know why I'm, I'm knocking and knocking on this door and it's not opening. Mm -hmm. So I decided maybe there's another door that I need to look for. Maybe that will open. Right. So um, I joined, so I was already a member of the um, Malaysian Association. American Association of Malaysia, but I joined their board as the membership director and I started running their monthly coffee mornings 
And um, I got involved with the board and helping out with their bigger events and um, editing and writing for their monthly publication. Um, and then when we moved to Balik Papan, I immediately became the secretary of the Balik Papan International Women's Association. And then um, they nominated me to be their president. And wow. I did, yeah, so I was the president of an expatriate women's club. And I it's love that. what a great opportunity for you, not only to meet other women and mm -hmm. people in the community, but to also share your gift. How awesome! Yes, it was. And I got to do everything that I was really good at, you know, so organizing and talking to people and listening to them to figure out, you know, how they could cooperate with each other. Um, in Balik Papan, um, on the board of directors, we had women representing seven different nationalities speaking wow. four different first tongues. So, and even amongst the national natural English speakers, you know, you had Americans and Aussies and one Scott. And believe me, we are all totally different as well. <laughs> right. I can imagine. I can imagine trying to come together and really understand each other, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we had Venezuelans that would just tell you off. But like, that's what wow. they, like they weren't, they wouldn't even be truly, they just get that fire and there's like, da -da -da -da. and then, you know, the Americans were like non-confrontational. Right. And we're like, uh, what do you put that? And then we had this Indian girl who also had her own ideas about how everything should be. And then it was very difficult for her to see a different way. And I had to look at the communication styles from all those different um, nationality backgrounds and try to understand, because I'm like coming from a place where I'm like, okay, we're all intelligent college graduates. And we all want the same thing, which is to raise as much money as possible for the charities and bring fun activities to the other expatriates and bring so the you were kind of the diplomat, the self-appointed diplomat, it sounds like. That could kind of bridge the gap between our, everybody. In our little mini UN, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which goes to show it's possible, right? Yes. <laughs> That's so yeah. amazing. They must have been so sad to see you leave. They were. <laughs> and that is true, actually, um, especially because I hadn't finished my term it was a two year term limit and I was one year into it. And then, you know, we got finished the job he was there to do. And then we got reassigned back to Malaysia. And when we got back to Malaysia, I immediately joined the board again as the corporate relations um, coordinator. So I was going and asking the country managers of Exxon, Shell, Hess for money, which was <laughs> fun. And that's where I really had to get over my, um, my money hangups um, because I needed to go to the Malaysian Chamber of Commerce events and sit with these guys and speak their language and you know get them to you know um, support our causes so that was really cool and then I became the president of that association as well and my you're such a leader Cindy you're such a, a natural born leader I love how every Everywhere you go, you kind of just start out in this little role, and then you're like, and then I was the president of the organization, and they're lucky to have you. I know that you're really, really talented and really great at what you do as a leader and also facilitator. I think you are, have a gift of really bringing people together mm -hmm. towards a common goal, and that's so important in our society today. I think there's so much separation in society today. Cultural separation, racial separation, economic separation, and we need people like you. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> true. It's very true. So I'm so glad that we've had an opportunity to meet and work together a little bit and um, I love that we're having this conversation, coming together right now and having this conversation. But I didn't mean to interrupt you. So you were no. um, going to these large corporate, um, I don't know, corporate heads to ask for funds. And what was the money going towards? So it was um, supporting our club and the causes that we support. So it was paying, it would pay our staff 
to do the jobs that they did. And then we, um, for instance, we raised $5,000 for the, um, the Malaysian Breast Cancer Society, which allowed them to install this new machine they had for better image screening. So it was very important. And yeah, they offered low cost or free mammograms. Um, yes. Awesome. For, yeah. And, you know, for women who really wouldn't have been able to get them probably otherwise. So it was really important work they were doing. And they also have um, housing they provide for. So when a child is having chemotherapy, because if they came in from the rural communities. Right. So the families could stay yeah. going through the treatment. Yeah. And they had, you know, these little places that were, you know, um, climate controlled for, you know, because obviously um, the child's immune system would be lower and, you know, it would be hard for the rural people who, you know, two generations ago were truly living in trees, you know, to figure that out. I mean, it was a huge jump for them anyway, and really a scary risk they were taking. Um, and we were really proud um, to be helpful with them. And then we had another orphanage that we supported that I also got, so I got to visit these places. And this is the beautiful thing about being on the ground in a second or third world country and being able to make a difference, but you're not just mailing a check in the mail, you're actually right. there. You get to actually physically see it manifest yes. in the people you're impacting. And I bet that must have been really powerful for you and probably, motivated you to go out and really go for the ask you know exactly <laughs> have a deep, they have deep pockets they want to uh, give back to the communities that they're in yes win-win so for everyone right yeah and we had um community service coordinators who also made sure the funds were being used in the way they were designated mm -hmm. so we would have the charities come in with specific asks and we had a calendar a fundraising calendar so that it would usually be predictable for us. We're going to have 5,000. We're going to have 3,000. We're going to have 15,000. Right. And then they would come in with their ask. And then when we gave them the money, we would also um, follow up with them for accountability to make sure. And like, I know things happen. And like, if they got a leak in their roof, I want them to use the money for that. Right. So I mean, right. it was, you but know, there was some just, sort of um, accountability, which is yeah. great because you don't want them just walking off with $15,000 and right. <laughs> up right so uh, yeah and then you go back again and the kids still don't all have a mattress like that's not right. <laughs> it's like we're trying to fix the problem but here's something interesting that I learned through that whole process that I try to always keep in mind it really was the best thing not for us to go in and make a list of what we thought they needed and then tell them what they needed the best way to help them was for them to prioritize as they saw fit and then for us to come on their terms because I mean there are so many cultural differences right. like now in Balik Papa and we helped another orphanage and when we went in and looked and the kids were sitting on the floor eating and there was like rat poo on the floor we were like oh my god we got to get pest control in here and we got the kids off we want to get the kids off the floor eating at a table well the interesting thing was they totally agreed please help us with the rats right but sitting on the floor was not a problem for them culturally you know they sit on the floor at home too. It's not that that wasn't seen as a necessity in the way that we Westerners saw it as a necessity. So sure. the money that we kept wanting to spend on tables and chairs for everybody, you know, they thought would be better suited, you know, for something else that they felt was more important. And we had to honor that because of course we're outsiders and we can't sure. just make them in our own image. Like, you know, <laughs> that, it, it really gives you perspective, doesn't it? Yes. You all have to respect everyone for where they are, who they are, respect their cultures, respect their values, and not impose what we're comfortable with. Absolutely. And I think that that goes just, I mean, that speaks to everyday life here in the U.S. as well. Yeah. All the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what a great experience for you. How old were you at that time? I was between the ages of 28 and 35. Wow. 
So you were, were you, so you were 35 when you moved back? Yes, I'd had my 35th birthday like two weeks before we came back. So yes. Wow. So. And, and did you come back to Houston? Like we, we both live in Houston, for those of you that are watching. Um, did you come back to Texas or were you assigned a different location? Yes, so we came to Houston, and this was my first time to live in Houston, and I'll say that, you know, so then I had culture shock again. Right, re-entry. <laughs> I think for seven years now, you know, I learned how to be an expat in a former British Commonwealth country, right. and now I had to come back here to America where everybody looks like me, and if I can't figure out how something works, people have no patience with me. <laughs> Like, because I came back and I was like, I was a foreigner in my own land, right? And I still had no idea how things worked. Like, I still have trouble with um, the credit card machine where you have to put the chip side in. I was like, what? Because that happened while I was gone. And then, <laughs> <laughs> phase, I just... <laughs> right, right. I didn't think about that. The card and they're like, no, you put it in the thing. And I'm like, oh. like <laughs> I did it today. I got lunch at Whole Foods, and I'm like handing them the card. And they're like, "You put it in the thing," and I'm like, "Okay, sorry." It's not hard, but <laughs> so like, how long have you been here now? Um, we got back in October of 2014. So um, that four years. Yeah, almost four years. So you started your company when you first got back, right? I mean, I know you had been writing. Right. Things, um, abroad. Yeah. So but when, how did that work? Yeah, I reinvented myself when I got back because there I was. I knew that academia was just not a possibility because with seven years of no publication history, I wasn't able to keep up with the research. You know, I didn't want to teach at five different universities one course, something. So, yeah. um, but I thought with all my experience with fundraising and working with nonprofits overseas, I would be great for something like that here. So I went for nonprofit jobs. I couldn't even get an interview. Then I, I can't believe that. that with all that experience. I'm surprised. I was too. I was very surprised and upset and I had other people look at my cover letter and resume and I'm like, you know, what's not happening here? And then I thought, well, you know, maybe I would go for some kind of writing jobs. So um, I did that as well. I would go on the creative group um, and look at writing jobs there and go for those. And I couldn't even get an interview there. And I'm like, this just doesn't even make That must have been so hard. You know, sometimes the universe is just pushing us in a certain direction. And if we don't really have an awareness of that, it can be so hard because it, it's like you're pushing so hard to go in this other direction and these doors keep slamming in your face and you start to feel bad and question your self-worth and what is wrong with me and my resume and everything. So <laughs> Yeah, it's like for you. trying to push the rock up the mountain and it's like <laughs> Yeah. It just keeps falling on me and <laughs> And like, I just had this thought because, um, you know, I have lost over 80 pounds and I'm also a former yeah. marathon runner. We so need to I, talk about that too, after we get through this, how you, you know, finally came to, to be, you know, in this company you formed. But after that, I just yeah. go back and ask about your health. <laughs> yeah, sure. And, you know, it kind of fits together. So it kind of came together here. And I'll t I can tell that story as I tell this one because they do a lot. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. So once I was in college and I was out of the toxic environment that I grew up in, the weight just started falling off because I didn't need to eat as a form of self-protection or self-medication. Right. And um, I lost 10 pounds like within the first two weeks of being in college. And I was like, mm -hmm. It's the opposite of the freshman 10. And um, like I literally started trading jeans with other girls in the dorm because they couldn't, they got too big for their jeans. And I got, <laughs> and then we would like swap out the 16 for the 14. And then I got to swap out the 12 for the 10. And it was great. Wow, that's and, awesome. Yeah. And, um, you know, I got down to, um, well, I lost a little bit more weight than I should have then because. All I knew was how to overeat and then how to diet. I didn't know how to just maintain a healthy weight. So, you know, I had to find my way there. 
But then, you know, um, from about, about the age of 24 to now, you know, I've just stayed with him, my uh, BMI. And when we moved to Malaysia, I also started running because I had always thought I would like to do long distance running, but I never had time to do that training during graduate school. Sure. So I have all this time. I'm going to, you know, in try a new sport um and so i won like several trophies in some running contests that's awesome. really uh, <laughs> that's so cool yes and um i'm trying to think what the most interesting one would be um well i came in um fourth place in the standard chartered kl half marathon in like 2011 which was really big um because that had, you know, thousands of people there and it was a really heavily funded event. And, you know, the winners were like people who came from the African countries, but they were in a special contest because obviously I wasn't fourth against them, but you know, against the other, against the other amateur athletes. And like, it was really great. So that must um, have felt so good for you to have the courage to enter, train, and then place. That's so incredible. Uh, it was, and I just, you know, like everything I do, I apply myself like 110%, mm -hmm. and that was no different, um, but I'd had a series of running injuries, and so by the time we got back to America, um, I had torn my hamstrings in the Paris Marathon in mm. 2014, and um, I was off running, but still exercising, and I thought, well, you know, I would make a great personal trainer because I could, I know all this information about nutrition. I could help people lose weight and having, you know, running injuries I've seen, but also doing really well. Like I'd seen both sides of it. So, um, I became a certified personal trainer and, um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a twist I wasn't expecting. Yeah. Um, with the purpose workout. Yeah. And they're actually my biggest client now. So, it all works together. So, um, as a trainer, yeah, like they knew that they had not just hired a girl who could, you know, give really clear instructions on what to do and not do with your shoulders when you're mm -hmm. weight, but that had a lot of other skills. So they, um, they promoted me to supervise the center and do quality control on the 1-800 number. And I created, you know, phone sales scripts and trained them on the scripts and raised their conversions in, June of 2016, they were at 67 percent, and I had them converting between 87 to 91 percent by that December. Amazing! Amazing! That's Thank amazing. you. You can't you can't make those results up. He's <laughs> really good. So, Cindy, um, I wanted to ask you: Did you do you take clients or accept clients that are outside of the Houston area? Because I know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Country, maybe the world are going to be watching this at some point, and I'd like to know if you work with people who aren't um, local. Yes, um, I have a client in Norway and one in the UK as well, and um, and one in Australia, um, also Montreal. So yes, awesome. <laughs> okay, great. So we'll put your web address down below so people can contact you there. And I also know that you are promoting a writer's workshop that you're going to be doing, you said, from October, and it's going to run through December, right, here in Houston. Yes. And that is going to be um, called Writing as Self-Expression. Want to speak a little bit to that? Yeah, um, so it's going to be at Write Space, which is a local nonprofit to promote the literary arts. And I taught the class last year and it sold out. So I'm really excited that more people have the opportunity to take the class again. And what we do is look at things from, look at the stories that you tell about yourself from your past. And then through a series of writing exercises, um, I help you look at them with new insight in a different way. And the exciting thing is I never know what you're going to unpack in your story, yeah. but <laughs> but I have a set of tools to help you unpack whatever it is. Um, and one of the evaluations that I got from a previous student said that um, I handled her trauma with such dignity and grace that I should be teaching other writing teachers how to help their students process trauma. So <laughs> That's awesome. I'm not surprised. And that's beautiful that you're actually 
not only creating a safe environment where people can share some of these experiences, but giving them tools to process. And yes. Some of the traumas from their past. Yeah, I really believe when you put words around things that you have no words for, you take the power away from, you know, that scary monster under the closet that. Right. right. That's great. So we'll actually also include the contact information for um, the location. So you can go on the website and sign up for her workshop if you'd like, if you're here in Houston, Texas. And I know that you've grown your business in such a short time to include four employees, right? Yes. Well, we've actually had a contraction. <laughs> oh. um, my staff member, Susanna, is an absolute rock star, and I am beyond the moon. She chooses to spend her time working with me. Um, we collaborate on almost everything we do. She has a JD from UT Austin, and she's brilliant. Um, she's also a former tech writer with Occidental. Mm -hmm. So um, if I am the creative person who just looks for the lines and tries to color outside them as much as possible, she is, you know, very structured and, you know, she'll <laughs> help fix all of that. And like the two of us together, um, getting all that gray matter on your project is um, a really powerful tool. Yeah. Well, tell me a little bit about what kind of services you offer. Yes. So our signature offer is we ghostwrite full length books. And what's different from ghostwriting than just normal content writing is, so if it's content writing, you know, you might tell me, um, I need a 500 word blog on the importance of hydration, which is really hot now. And we just crank that out. What a ghostwriter will do is say, why is hydration important to your people now? What do you specifically want to say to them about it? You know, what are, you know, we pull out your ideas and we also find your voice so that when we do the writing, then when you read it, it feels like it's from you. And that obviously helps connect with the readers because when someone's interacting with you online for the first time, like through reading blogs or reading your articles or maybe reading your book, um, the more that you can sound like you're... It needs to be consistent, right? Yes. So. With my method, we don't just help you talk to people and just get your ideas out there, but we are trying to help you form a relationship with those readers so that they will become your clients or take whatever action that you are going to ask them to take. And we do that, um, I have what I call the trifecta, where we figure out the common um, concerns, values, and interests that you also share with those readers. And that's going to have nothing to do with, for instance, hydration. Right. But, um, you know, those things that it, but, you know, the fact that you're from Hawaii is definitely something that, I mean, who doesn't love Hawaii? That's why I wore my flower today. <laughs> so that I can connect with you. <laughs> right, right. By putting those little, embellish, those little embellishments in your writing, um, you're more memorable. People like you and trust you more, which of course is how you build those relationships in the digital space that, you know, turn into working relationships or, you know, consistent product sales. Right. So once you do this writing or editing, I loved, I, I, I wrote this down because I thought this was so great. It was like very godmother editing. Maybe you want to speak to what that, what that is. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes you don't need a ghostwriter to get your first draft out. Like you can knock out that messy first draft and then it's like, what do you do with it once it's written? And um, I started offering fairy godmother editing because I would meet people who would say, well, I've kind of already written a book, but it's awful. And I'd be like, well, I can't be that bad or maybe it is, but we can fix it. So, um, with fairy godmother editing, you, um, if we're going to write the book together, what that looks like is you send me, you know, 10 to 20 pages as you write it. And then I start fixing it. I look for areas of opportunity. If there's a detail that needs to be added, um, I have a client who's writing a very personal memoir. I can't add her detail. I have no idea what it is, but I'm like, you said your grandmother was cooking. It would be great if we could smell what was on the stove. Right, right. You know, what was it? How did it smell? It How did it feel? and nudging and um, kind of, I feel like, enriching the content that's already there. 
Yes. And sometimes it's a matter of moving things around that belong together. I have another client who sent me her book draft. We got it finished in six weeks with fairy godmother editing. Wow. And a lot of it was just saying, Oh, chapter two and chapter 16 say almost the same thing. So it was a self-help book. Right. And I was like, you know, so we need to just put those two together. Yeah. Look at the order of the chapters and the ideas and make sure that that's making sense and kind of building up to something. And then just within each chapter saying, does all the information flow in a logical way? If not, what do we need to move? And like, that's all very methodical. And it, you know, it's not, I mean, if you're, if you enjoy this kind of thing, <laughs> it can happen very quickly. And something that looks like a mess, like um, James Joyce said that when we see chaos, we impose order. It, our brains just work that way. And that's the way that I see it happening for me with drafts. Like I did it as a college um, professor with the student drafts where they would turn in a mess and I would see the possibility and I'll be like, you need to move this paragraph here. You need to rework this one. This needs to be broken so up. That's almost your, your um, magic superpower. Yes. The order out of chaos. It really is. And sometimes that's the chaos is in your brain. So we got to get it to paper and sometimes it's already on paper, but we just need to make it make sense. Fine tune it. Fine tune. Well, we're just about out of time. It's been so great having this time to talk to you, about your story. Um, anything you want to share, anything you've learned or words of wisdom you'd like to share before we sign off today that help people. Well, I think you can notice there's something consistent for me because when I come to forks in the road, I don't just take the easy way. I mean, even with the perfect workout, I could have remained, you know, just working in an HQ capacity instead of starting my own business. And once again, <laughs> going into uncharted territory. And I would just say when you're making your life decisions and, you know, not to just take the easy way by default, but to really think what feels better and makes you more excited. And like, that's the path that's probably going to lead you to a place where wherever your lands, you're going to be really glad you made the decisions that got you there. That's awesome. So you've been excellent about listening to your heart when it's, yeah. when it's, when it comes time to make major life decisions it sounds like and it, I don't think you've made a wrong choice I think it's taken you led you right here right on time right yes thank you that that's my belief as well <laughs> let me advice. so I'm gonna go ahead and add all of your content um, contact information at the very end of this video also I just want to thank all of you watching today for tuning in to the path of me i hope that you will subscribe like and share to my youtube channel wendy hutchinson and i hope you all make it a great day be kind to yourselves and i love y'all thank you